Hey everyone, how's it going? So today's video I'm extremely excited about. It's a video that is so cool, but at the same time, I've done a lot of these. I've done Magikarp, I've done Aber with no special moves, I've done no damage. And all of them were kind of difficult at parts, and some of them were very difficult, but I'm being completely honest, none of them compare to how difficult this Ditto run is. I mean, I'm not just saying that so that you watch, this isn't false hype, so let's get right to it. First thing we need to talk about is how Ditto works. So, as you know, Ditto has one move, Transform, which changes you into the other Pokémon. But if we go a little bit more in depth, let's talk about what's actually happening. So, we know that Pokémon have stats, and you can see them on the stats screen. Well, when Ditto transforms, its stats become the exact same stats as the opponent Pokémon, with two exceptions. Number one, its HP stays the same, and number two, its level stays the same. Everything else becomes identical to the opponent. Now, at first, this doesn't sound like it would be such a problem, just mirror matches, right? But there are a couple issues. Number one is that you only get five power points of each of the moves, because many trainers have quite a few Pokemon, so you could easily run out of power points. But the second problem is that the first two Pokemon in a mirror match will theoretically cancel each other out, not leaving you with very much power points or hit points for the second Pokemon. There are many examples. Uh, Youngster Allen's a good example, Bugcatcher Rick. They're all early game trainers with two Pokemon, and I wasn't able to defeat any of them, because not only would I run out of power points, but even if I had infinite power points, I wouldn't have enough HP, because I'm just weak. One thing that I think is really clear is that opponents don't train their Pokemon very well. They usually have no EVs and pretty poor IVs, and yes, they are consistent, at least in Generation 3, every single battle. And while in a normal run that makes it easier, in this run, it makes it a whole lot more difficult, especially if we have to use the first one, which is typically the weakest Pokémon, to defeat all of them. So, what am I going to end up doing? Well, funny enough, there's going to be a lot of different things I can do later on, but for now, I have a few tricks up my sleeve. One of them is to not transform at all. You can just use up all your transforms, and then use Struggle, which is a 50 base power, typeless move. It does deal recoil damage, a quarter of the damage you deal is dealt back to you, but even though Ditto doesn't have great base stats, in the early game, it's good enough, and it takes advantage of Ditto's ability to level up, and so you don't have to rely on the terrible stats of the Pokémon of the early game. This is really helpful for wild Pokémon and weaker trainer battles throughout the run. However, it's not enough. There are going to be some situations, Roxanne being one of them, which I'll talk about very shortly, that struggle isn't going to work, but we still need to improve our odds. So one of the ways we can go about doing that is leveling up. But wait, Jeros, how does leveling up help? Didn't you say you copy the stats? Well, yes, but in fact, the way damage is calculated in Pokemon is also partially dependent on your level, which I didn't actually know because when you level up, your stats usually go up. So I just thought it's because my stats were better. But no, even leveling up has an impact. It's not nearly as much of an impact as leveling up plus your stats going up, but it can potentially be the difference between something being a three hit KO or a four hit KO, which is very important. So leveling up is definitely something we're gonna need to do. We can't just stay at a super low level. And on top of that, our HP carries over. So we can EV train, and there are Wismer available near Route 116, and that's super helpful because no matter whether we're using Struggle or Transforming, that HP will come in handy. So those are the tools we have at our disposal. Are they going to be enough to defeat Roxanne? <laughs> no. No, they're not. And this was the first major hurdle in this run. So at first, I tried Transforming. Now, Roxanne's first Geodude is at level 12. It knows Tackle, Defense Curl, Rock Tomb and Rock Throw. So at this level, if my Geodude uses Rock Tomb or Rock Throw, it'll do about 15% damage to Roxanne's Geodude. That is, of course, until she uses a Defense Curl, in which case it does less. However, I don't attack immediately. I instead use Defense Curl. Why? 
Well, it's clear that I'm not going to have enough power points to beat all three of Roxanne's rock Pokemon. Rock is not very effective against ground, and Geodude are both ground types. So I'm actually going to have to use Struggle as a Geodude. And if you're wondering why not use Struggle as a Ditto, we'll talk about that in a second, but Geodude just has way better stats, so I want to take advantage of that, especially its defense. But how many defense curls to use, when to attack, I hadn't figured that out yet, and I actually made very good progress in this battle. I was able to knock out both of Roxanne's Geodude. She actually has two potions that she can use in addition to her nose pass having an Orin Berry. So that's 50 more HP than you would think. And to be quite honest, I didn't make it very far against the nose pass at all until I was knocked out. But now let me show you an attempt where I stay as Ditto and you struggle. Now I do do more damage, especially if I get a critical hit but I'm not doing a whole bunch, and the bigger problem is how much damage I take back. Because Rock Tomb is resisted by Geodude when I'm transformed, and it only does about 4 or 2 damage once I use a defense curl. As Ditto, depending on my levels, doing like 9-ish damage. Plus it lowers my speed, which is very bad, meaning the Geodude will be able to attack more frequently. Plus, once they use defense curl, I'll be dealing less damage, and I have to factor in recoil damage. I tried a few times and I never even made it to Nose Pass with just a Ditto. Having said that, I rarely made it to the Nose Pass with Transform Ditto. It did perform better, but that first battle was very lucky. Consider that Rock Tomb and Rock Throw each have an 80% chance, meaning there's a 20% chance it misses. And when the opponent uses Defense Curl is important. The longer it takes before it uses that Defense Curl, the better. Also, how long it takes to use Rock Tomb versus Rock Throw if I'm out speeding, that's better too. And as I battle Roxanne again and again, I learn more and more, and yet I'm still not even close to knocking out the Nose Pass. When I do get there, I usually don't even get it to the point where it needs to use its Orin Berry. And this is why I level up a little bit more. By leveling up against Whismur, I'm gaining more HP EVs which is going to be very helpful, plus I do a little bit more damage. So the question you're probably asking is how much did I need to level up? The answer? Level 22. Not too too bad, only 4 hours and 11 minutes. Considering how long it's taken me in some of the red and blue runs, definitely not going to complain too much. Now at this point I developed a very complicated strategy depending on what Roxanne did. So in this battle, she hits me with Rock Tomb first, meaning there's a high probability she uses Defense Curl anyway, so might as well set up one Defense Curl. Since we're dealing with such low numbers, the first Defense Curl has the highest benefit. On the next turn, we both decide to use Rock Tomb, but hers misses, mine doesn't, so now we're at a speed tie. But then, of course, mine misses, and she uses Defense Curl. Very bad when Rock Tomb misses because I have so few of them. But, something that needed to happen if I wanted to win, was getting a few critical hits. She goes for Rock Throw, which is good, because it's only dealing 2 damage, and it doesn't lower my speed. So I'm faster. But the truth is, that actually is not what I should have done. Because she's used enough defense curls, I'm going to be doing very little damage with Rock Tomb or Rock Throw. So I should waste all my defense curl power point. This isn't the badge boost glitch, which doesn't exist. Or about raising my defense, I'm not going to have enough power points to win this battle. And I figured out that the best strategy, assuming I don't get incredibly lucky, is to simply try and get struggle with this first Geodude. So use all 20 of my power points. The reason being is that struggle is going to be dealing way more damage since it's typeless than Rock Tomb or Rock Throw. And while this Geodude is going to have many turns to set up defense curls and boost its defense, so you may not notice the big difference, the next Geodude hopefully won't have as many turns. So while I am hoping for critical hits and it is very helpful, I still do want to run out of power points, so I'm trying to do both. And thus, this part of the battle really doesn't matter, especially because she's going to use that potion, which pretty much restores her Geodude to full health. And now I finally run out of all my power points and I can start using Struggle. At this point, every crit is super great. I want as many as possible because the more critical hits I get, the more HP I have for the last two Pokemon. I do have an Orin Berry equipped, 
to give me 10 more HP, but I still lost time and again, so it's not like this was a guaranteed winning strategy. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen, and that would be optimal, but I make it to the second with 36 health, which is pretty good. Now it decides to go for tackle, and here you see how much better struggle is. That's about a quarter of its health. I then get another tackle, which is really good, because I don't want to see defense curl. Unfortunately, next turn I do get a defense curl. I have to use my Orenberry, that's automatic once I reach a certain threshold. And Roxanne uses her second potion, which I'd rather her use here than with Nose Pass, which can happen. So I'm fine with this. She alternates between attacking and using some more defense curls, but again, slowly but surely, Struggle does some damage, and I make it to Nose Pass with 32 HP, having already used my Orenberry. Which you think would be enough, but I have lost with even more HP than this. Because Nose Pass knows Harden, and has great defense, and it can just outlast me. Especially if Roxanne gets a critical hit. Case in point, turn 1 Harden, look how little Struggle is doing. Nose Pass has exceptional defense, even when compared to Geodude. But for the rest of this battle, we just exchange attacks. And while it looks like, oh, it's so easy, it's only doing 1 HP, she gains the Orenberry, and then you start to see slowly my health whittling down. Also, I get the 1 HP of recoil every time I attack her, and I do win. But had she gotten a critical hit, I would have lost. And considering how many attacks we traded, the fact that neither of us got a critical hit was quite unlikely. But hey, that's 4 hours and 11 minutes. You can see now why I spent so much time EV training and leveling up. And also why I had to do this fight as Geodude. I needed that extra defense and that resistance to rock so that I would have enough turns which allowed me the amount of turns I needed to finally get past Roxanne. And usually this is where I go, the run got easy, but it doesn't. There's nothing to really talk about because I don't want this video to be four hours long, and it could be. But there isn't a single battle in this run that's easy. Because transforming is always going to have the problem that you're using the opponent's terrible stats against them. And struggle is usually the best way to go, but every attack takes away so much of your own HP that it's just so easy if you get a critical hit or maybe get paralyzed or confused to just lose. I lost to trainers I've never lost to in my life. That being said, if you plan ahead, you usually can win, but it means unlike regular runs where you have all these unimportant battles where you don't really need much strategy, you just attack and win, there are almost none of them here, which made it super fun for me to do, but also very frustrating because I lost a lot. However, the one gym leader I only lost a single time to, and yes, that was a record, is Brawly. Now, because I only faced him twice, I don't have a ton of insight other than to say his battle isn't that bad. I used Transform to transform into Machop. Machop has pretty good stats and attacks, especially Bulk Up, and what I did was use two Bulk Ups. Unfortunately, Machop kept using Seismic Toss, which just deals damage equal to its level, meaning my defensive Bulk Ups weren't helping. But even when it used Bulk Up, Without getting a critical hit, it only took two Karate Chops, which are now Fighting type, to defeat Machop. Now, Meditite is a joke so long as it doesn't use Reflect, which it can. It only knows Focus Punch as an attacking move, which would deal lots of damage, but if you attack, Focus Punch doesn't work. I get a critical hit and knock it out, so that's good. And Makuhita is pretty heavy, so I go for Low Kick because it does more damage the heavier the Pokemon is. Almost knocks it out. Brawly Citrus Berry activates, which gives back 30 HP, and he uses Bulk Up twice, but I'm still doing enough damage with Low Kick to knock out Makuhita, and this one actually, as you can tell by my level, didn't take me all that long. But after defeating some more trainers, it's time to talk about Mei. Now, Mei is very interesting for a couple of reasons. Mei or Brendan's team pretty much entirely depends on what their starter is. That usually will happen towards the end of the game, but in just the second battle, their entire team will be different. And in addition, if they have Grovile, what order Brendan slash May sends out the Pokemon depends on their gender. Completely, I have no idea why that is. It doesn't work for the other two starters, but with Grovile, that happened. And I got the best case scenario completely unintentionally. 
I picked Mudkip because Mudkip can learn all the water HMs, dive, waterfall, and surf. There are a bunch of them. And I picked the male character because, well, I don't know, I'm a guy and I usually pick the male character. That's how it works, and that's why I didn't know about this. Now, May can have a Lombre, a Slugma, and a Wingle. If it's Brendan and a Grovile, it will go Slugma, Wingle, Grovile. That would be awful. But we're getting Wingle, Slugma, Grovile, which is amazing. And let's just show you how it works. I'm going to use Transform, and the first bit is a little scary because Wingle is pretty powerful, but very frail. Thankfully, I knock out May's Wingle with 25 HP. I'm able to make it to Grovile after knocking out Slugma with Water Gun. Grovile uses Pursuit, which is a little lucky, but I use Wing Attack and it's a one-hit KO. So a fight that could have gone very poorly, especially if I picked the female character and had to have Slugma leading off. So I'm very, very grateful it worked out this way, but... Don't get excited, because now we have to face Watson. And Watson, like in Feebas, is just a total nightmare. And the biggest reason is that his first Pokemon is awful to transform into. So Watson has four Pokemon, Voltorb, Electric, Magneton, and Manectric. The Voltorb knows four moves, Shockwave and Spark. Neither of those are very helpful since we're battling Electric Pokemon. It has Self-Destruct, which in a solo run is an unusable move. And it has Rollout. Now the only way Voltorb would work is if you use Rollout and get some critical hits. But then you encounter the problem of Magneton. Magneton is a Steel type and Steel resists Rock. Plus, Voltorb, while it has decent speed, does not have great attack. In addition, Electric Pokemon can be paralyzed in Generation 3. This is not something that can happen nowadays, but back then it could. And once you're paralyzed, it's just awful. So I battled Watson three times, and I was never even able to knock out Magneton, let alone get to his toughest Pokemon, Manectric. And so I decided to battle all the trainers. There are tons of trainers all around Mobile City. So I battled all of them, and I leveled up. But I didn't just level up. I went and did some EV training. Because while we did EV train a bit for HP, we're going to want to gain some attack EVs. This won't help while transform, but it just doesn't look like transforming is going to be the right call. The thing that's kind of fun about Ditto is that every battle needs to be handled a little differently, and not one strategy will just work constantly. So I haven't done struggle against a gym leader yet, but obviously I'm going to need to level up to a pretty high level, and I'm going to need to not get paralyzed. So I finally rebattle Watson again at level 37. I've done a ton of EV training too, so my attack is pretty good. Voltorb and Electric are two hit KOs, but Magneton was still a major issue. Even at level 37, it's a four hit KO, and Watson, like Roxanne, has potions, in this case, super potions, which pretty much restored Magneton to full health. Meanwhile, I'm pretty much out of health, even though I've used my Orenberry. So I decided to see, maybe I got unlucky, let's try again, and even though I do a little bit better, I'm still not making it past Magneton. And again, we have one more Pokemon to go. So time to EV train a little bit more. I didn't max out my attack because that would take a very long time. I just trained a little bit. There are Poochiena in the grass on Route 116 and Merrill. Both of those are pretty useful because HP is always going to help. In addition, I started to catch Zigzagoon and give them to the daycare. Now, Zigzagoon, in Ruby and Sapphire, I mentioned how I use them to pick up rare candies. They can still do that, but they need to be at least at level 21. They can also pick up other useful items, which we'll talk about a bit later. Now, you can't get them at level 21 in a solo run. There's no other way to train them except by putting them in the daycare and just running around, which I'm doing a bunch of anyway. So... This is actually a pretty useful strategy that I would use throughout this run to get items I needed via pickup. Also, just for the record, Zigzagoon are really good for HMs. They can learn pretty much all of them. So having a bunch of Zigzagoon on my team was never really too much of a problem. However, I started to realize that maybe Rare Candies wasn't what I needed. There's another item I can get at level 11 that could be very helpful, the King's Rock. Now the King's Rock has a 10% chance of getting the opposing Pokemon to flinch. Unfortunately, it can only be picked up by Zigzagoon at a pretty low level a mere 1% of the time. 
and Zigzagoon will only pick up an item after battle 10% of the time. So an individual Zigzagoon only has a 1 in 1,000 chance of getting a King's Rock, and with 5, after every battle, it's only a 1 in 200 chance. Now that sounds awful, and it is, but consider how many battles I'm having. I mean, here's a good example. I level up here, plus 5 in HP and attack. Stats aren't recalculated in Generation 3 until after you level up, which is why you get these massive boosts since I've been EV training. And since I'm battling so often, it gives plenty of opportunity for Zigzagoon to potentially pick up a King's Rock, and eventually I do. Another thing I just want to mention quickly is once you beat the Wind Straits just north of Moville, you get the Macho Brace, which doubles the amount of EVs that you gain. So that's a big reason why EV training now is way better than EV training at the start. But I've EV trained, I'm at level 40, I equipped the King's Rock, surely I will beat Watson here. <laughs> yeah, no. Because in addition to Thunder Wave, Magneton no Supersonic, I hit myself in confusion twice, and yeah, awesome. But then I battled Watson again, the Voltorb struggle almost knocks it out, but it survives on just a little bit of health, so Watson uses the Super Potion here, which is pretty good. I'm able to knock out the Voltorb on the next turn. The same thing happens with the Electrike minus the Super Potion, and it barely does any damage. Now, the Magneton uses Sonic Boom, which all things considered is the best thing that could have happened unless Sonic Boom missed, which would have been even better. On turn two, I get the King's Rock Flinch, which was super helpful, and then I'm able to knock it out on turn three. But I've never faced this Manectric before. How is this going to go? Well, turn one, it uses Howl, and turn two, I get a critical hit. And even with that insane luck, I am left with just 10 HP, meaning I only had 9 HP to spare from Magneton or Manectric attacking me. Yeah, I'm not really sure what I would have done if I'd lost here, but I didn't, and I'd spent hours. Not on the Watson battle itself, I didn't need to keep redoing it to see I didn't have a chance, but to prepare and make sure that my Ditto could potentially win. And even still, at this super high level, using a King's Rock and getting a flinch, I still just barely, barely won. But now that I'm at level 40, I can use Struggle because I'm at a super high level and the rest of the run's gonna be easy, right? No. No, it won't. And to get to a difficult battle, we have to go no further than the battle on Mount Chimney against Maxi. Now, Maxi leads off with a Mighty Enna, and the Mighty Enna has just one attacking move, Bite. It is same type, but in Generation 3, don't forget, all Dark moves are classified as Special, and Mighty Enna has Terrible Special. And the long and the short of it was, I didn't even have enough Bite Power Points to knock out Mighty Enna, let alone his other two Pokémon. So easy, just use Ditto, right? Well, there's a problem with that too. Mighty Enna has the ability Intimidate which lowers Ditto's attack. And so, I could do damage, but not nearly enough, and Mighty Anna also has Sand Attack, Zubat has Supersonic, and Camerupt is pretty strong, even though it doesn't have the best attacking moves. Magnitude can do some decent damage. I wasn't coming close. I'm so overleveled, and yet still, I'm being stonewalled by Maxi. If only there were a way to get rid of Intimidate, if only there was something I could do. Wait a minute, there is something I could do. There is an NPC on Route 104, the northern section, just outside the pretty petal flower shop, and after you've defeated Watson, she will give you a White Herb. Now, White Herb in the competitive game is super useful because it gets rid of negative stat effects, and you can combine that for some pretty good strategies. But in this case, I mean, I never usually use it anyways, what a great idea to use it here against Maxi's Mighty Enna. That would negate the stat drop, and I probably could defeat her team, right? Well, let's try it. Well, it still wasn't that good. I mean, I was making it further, don't get me wrong, but because Mighty Enna was a six-hit KO, yes, a three-hit KO, and then Maxi would heal with a Super Potion, that gave Mighty Enna plenty of opportunity to use Sand Attack or Zubat to use Supersonic, and I just didn't have enough HP for Camera Up. In this battle, I mean, I get a critical hit against the Mighty Anna, that's pretty lucky. Zubat, it's a two-hit KO as well, even with the Super Potion, because it doesn't quite get it back to full HP, so that was pretty good. 
I'm still not at great health for camera up, but it uses focus energy turn one, doesn't get a crit turn two, and I'm able to knock it out with, again, almost no HP remaining. And this was my fifth attempt at this battle with the White Herb. I told you guys I wasn't hyping this up. Thankfully, unlike Maxi, Flannery isn't as bad, but she's still pretty annoying and took me multiple attempts, but that's just because of the random nature of the Pokemon we transform into, Nummel. Now, Nummel has a pretty decent moveset. It has Overheat, Body Slam, and Magnitude. Sunny Day I don't care about. Magnitude can deal different damage depending on randomness. And we don't always need it to do the very most, but sometimes it can deal a little too much or a little too little damage that will cause me to lose the battle. And this happened five times previously. But here's how I'd like to see things. So for the first Nummel, I get hit with Overheat. That's not ideal. But since I already transformed, it's not very effective. And then I get Magnitude 8. But with Magnitude 8, it's a one-hit KO, and that's a good thing. Now, I realized that I could run out of Magnitudes. So I use Overheat against Slugma. It doesn't knock it out. It misses with Smog which was probably the best case scenario. And then I use Takedown to knock it out. So it's looking good, but we have the toughest Pokemon yet to come. Now here's where I need some good RNG. Camerupt will usually go for Sunny Day on its first turn, which it did here, but then it'll use Overheat, which combined with Sunny Day and Nemel's poor stats is pretty bad. Even though it's not very effective, I get Magnitude 9, which knocks out Camerupt. Not complaining here. We have tons of HP for Torkoal and Torkoal, was always the Pokemon that would end my runs. Don't forget, Sunny Day is already up. It has Overheat and a White Herb of its own. That's how White Herb is usually used. I get a Magnitude 6, which is bad, but a critical hit, which is good. It uses Body Slam. I don't get paralyzed, and then Magnitude 10. So, yeah, that's why I said it was annoying. It's pretty much all about good Magnitude luck, and it's annoying that I have to use an inherently lucky move, but... Those are the cards were dealt, and I think I did as good as could be expected. One out of five isn't too bad. But, after we defeat Flannery, we get a gym leader that should have rivaled or even surpassed Watson in difficulty, Norman. Now, Norman has a different team than you probably remember, because a lot of you probably played Ruby and Sapphire. I, too, thought he had two slacking and a Vigoroth, but that's in Ruby and Sapphire, and Emerald... He actually leads with a Spinda, and then has a Lanoon, Vigoroth, and a Slacking. Not being Slacking is actually good, because Slacking only attacks one every two turns. So I wasn't too upset about that, but Spinda, it's not great. Its moveset isn't that bad. It knows Facade, which is base 70 power, since I'm not going to be status. Psybeam, which is pretty much unusable. Teeter Dance, which can confuse. And Encore, which can be super useful against Slacking, since it can lock it into a move, and then Slacking doesn't attack. But how the battle went at the beginning is I would most of the time knock out Spinda and then slacking would just make quick work of me as Spinda. I then tried using Struggle with Ditto, but that also wasn't working because it wasn't quite a two hit KO. It was a three hit KO and Norman has hyper potions. So I would get Spinda to very low HP. It would heal, which effectively makes it a five hit KO and then just recoil damage. Even if I didn't hit myself in confusion or anything, would make it almost impossible to beat Slacking, let alone the rest of Norman's team. So I need that Spinda to be a two-hit KO because then Norman can't heal, and I'll figure out the rest later. Let's just get past his second Pokemon. So I level up and I come back. And even at my current level, it's still not a two-hit KO. So better level up again, right? Wrong. Let's try being Spinda again. I know it didn't work, and I know nothing much has changed, but let's try it and see how it works this time. Now, nothing really weird happens against Spinda, but then I level up, and wait a second, doesn't it seem like I'm doing a little bit more damage to Slacking? Like, way more damage. I know it's still not a lot because of Slacking's defenses, but that's kind of weird, don't you think? Why am I suddenly dealing more damage? And my defense is way better too. I'm not taking back nearly as much damage. What the heck is happening? Well, I figured something out. Something that is about as much of a glitch as the badge boost glitch in that when I figured it out I wasn't trying to do anything, but this happened enough times and eventually it happened on a Pokemon with such poor attack like a ball toy that I figured out what was going on and I decided to use it to my advantage. I wouldn't win this battle by the way, I still had to do a little bit more, but when you level up 
your stats no longer are the stats of Spinda. They're ditto stats. The game gets confused when you level up, and I tried to look for ditto glitch, ditto transform glitch. I couldn't find anything, but this is totally a thing. And I know this is supposed to be glitchless, but to me, this falls into the same category as the badge boost glitch. I can't control when I level up, and yes, now that I know this exists, I'm intentionally manipulating my HP just like I do with the badge boost glitch, but no one else told me about it, and I figured it out on my own. I'm sure people already knew about it, but it just gives us another tool. And it didn't work yet, but maybe if we pick up the Silk Scarf, which powers up normal moves, we may just have a chance to beat Norman with our new Level Up Transform Strat. Well, it took many attempts, and slowly but surely, I started figuring out a good strategy that worked. Now, like always, PowerPoint management is key. So you'll see me use a Psybeam against Spinda instead of using Facade. You'll also see the opposing Spinda use Teeter Dance. I guess Norman doesn't realize I'm a Spinda too now. That's great because I can use Encore, locking it into Teeter Dance and essentially making this part of the battle free. Now, even though I'm doing more damage, it's still slacking. So I use Teeter Dance because I need it to hit itself in confusion at least a little bit, or I won't have enough HP. It hits itself in confusion the first turn. That's good. Now, you might be wondering, will slacking be able to attack after it hits itself in confusion? No, it doesn't. So hitting itself in confusion is extra great. Unfortunately, it doesn't hit itself in confusion. Facade does major damage. However, I plan for that too. And with its Citrus Berry, it gains enough HP back that Norman won't use his Hyper Potion, and I'm able to knock it out with just one more facade. But the battle isn't over yet, not by a long shot. I've actually gotten past the slacking many times. And now the Pokemon can attack every turn, so I confuse Vigoroth, and it also hits itself in Confusion on turn 1. This is awesome, because one Confusion and two Psybeams are enough to knock out Vigoroth, and I don't use Facade, because I don't have a lot of them left. Out comes Lanoon. I use Facade. It's not quite a one-hit KO, but Lanoon tries to go for Belly Drum. It doesn't have enough HP. Norman does use his Hyper Potion, but I was prepared for this. I don't have enough attacking moves, but if it hits itself in Confusion just one time, I will win. Very annoying, stressful battle, but it's over. Man, that was tough. And had I not figured out the Level Up glitch, this could have taken a whole lot longer, but now we have a third strategy that we can use. But that's surely all we have, right? I'm not going to come up with a fourth strategy, or am I? Yeah, yes, I am. And this doesn't rely on any glitches or anything. This was something I had planned since the very beginning, and we're going to call it the Delepa strategy, because it's using a Lepa Berry and it's delayed. And the first time I used it was against Winona. Because if we take a look at her first Pokemon, Swablu, Swablu is awful since it only has a single attacking move in Aerial Ace. And even if we were to use the same strategy we used against Norman, it takes two Aerial Aces to knock out her Swablu, only giving us three for the rest of her Pokemon. That won't work. And they're not going to be one-hit KOs anyway. So Transform and Transform with Level Up aren't an option. Let's try Struggle. That didn't work well for me either. I was barely able to make it past Tropius. Tropius has pretty good defense. Ditto doesn't have great attack. Sure, I can EV train a little more, especially now that there are Mighty Enna, and I will do that, but neither of these strategies were working. So, I had to come up with a strategy that did work, and it did require a little bit of luck, at least to start. It only would work 8% of the time, but when I would get that amazing 8% chance, it worked really well. And before I show you the battle footage, let's just talk a little bit about what the Delepa strategy really is. You see, Lepa Berries, when held in battle, don't activate immediately. Activate after the first turn is passed if you don't have any power points left. So, we can use Struggle to knock out the first Pokemon, and then transform into Tropius, a much better Pokemon, Winona's second. We can then combine that with the level up glitch to give us improved ditto stats. And the idea was we should be able to win. Of course, 
the problem, as you are now seeing, is Struggle is not a one-hit KO against Swablu. It's a two-hit KO. It's not actually that close. Unless I get a critical hit. So I would just try for the critical hit and reset. Some of you might not like that. You might say, J-Rose, that's not in the spirit of how you usually do your challenges. However, the alternative is just leveling up a whole bunch. To me, using a creative but kind of lucky silly strategy versus leveling up, I will always go for the crazy silly strategy. So, let's finally show the battle where I get the critical hit. Now, I don't level up, which isn't that big a deal, because Tropius has pretty good stats too. Not as good as Ditto, but good enough that it's still a two-hit KO with Aerial Ace. Winona's Tropius sets up Sunny Day, which is awesome, because I have Solar Beam. Winona's Tropius also uses Aerial Ace, but I have way more HP, and so I'm able to knock out her Tropius with still a huge amount left, but the scariest Pokemon are yet to come. Now, this Pelipper is one of my least favorite Pokemon because it likes to spam Protect. It does that turn one, and Solar Beam is a range. I don't get it. Annoying. But there is a bit of an upside. I know she's going to use Hyper Potion, so might as well use this free turn to set up another Sunny Day, allowing me to use Solar Beam without charging up. I anticipate a Protect, so I go for Synthesis to gain HP back. Pelipper uses Aerial Ace. It has pretty poor attack, so it's not that big a deal. I get the damage range on Solar Beam, and down goes Pelipper. Now, Altaria was one of the scariest Pokemon because it knows Dragon Dance and Aerial Ace, and that is a very bad combo. Thankfully, because the sun is still up, I still outspeed, and she has an Oran Berry, which is annoying. So I go for Solar Beam because I don't want her to heal with a Hyper Potion here. Then the sun fades, she hits me with an Aerial Ace. I'm almost knocked out, but I'm able to get off my Aerial Ace and knock out Altaria, leaving one Pokemon left, a very annoying Pokemon, in Skarmory, because Solar Beam's not going to be very effective, Aerial Ace is going to be not very effective, I'm at super low health, but thank goodness, Tropius is Synthesis, what an excellent Pokemon to use. So first things first, let's heal with the Synthesis, and then I'm going to go for Sunny Day. That serves two purposes, one, the Solar Beam thing, but two, you actually gain back way more HP with Synthesis. I just want to say here, this is what makes Ditto Challenge so fun. Having to work with these movesets that the AI trainers never use to their fullest potential, it's just, it's a really awesome thing. Now at this point, I realized there was a very good chance I didn't knock out Skarmory with my existing power points. So I need to stagger my moves appropriately so I'm ready to use Struggle. And that means healing only when I absolutely need to and also using Sunny Day. Unfortunately, I also get hit with Sand Attack, so that's going to be really annoying, but what can you do? Eventually, I use up my final Sunny Day and I'm going to be honest, I have no idea if that critical hit mattered, but I don't miss and I knock out Skarmory. Definitely would have knocked me out since I would have taken back recoil damage and Aerial Ace would have done 30 plus damage. But you know what? My crazy strategy that I came up with one night years ago as I was thinking about doing a ditto run, it actually worked. And maybe it wasn't the best strategy, I still think it was, but it looked really cool and I got to use it in a video, so I am pretty happy. And that will cease pretty quick. Because we're actually coming up to the worst gym leaders. That's right, not Roxanne, not Norman, not Winona, Tate and Liza. And they're not the toughest battle in the run. Don't close off after I beat them. They're just the toughest gym leader. And they are the seventh, so they should be pretty tough. But the hardest thing about Tate and Liza is that it's a double battle in a solo Pokemon challenge. So I'm just going to use a Magikarp in order to give me a second Pokemon. They will not allow you to battle them with only one Pokemon. But on turn one, the Claydol uses Earthquake, and that will knock out Magikarp anyway. So you don't have to worry about Magikarp at all. Now, I battled these guys again and again and again. Because there are just so many different options for what I should do. Should I use the Delapa strategy? Should I use Vanilla Transform and use their Pokemon stats? Should I use Level Glitch Transform? Level Glitch plus Delapa? What worked? What didn't? What item should I equip? There was just so many different things. And battle calculators are great and all. But I feel like I need to just really see how the strategies work in practice. What the various luck factors are, what the AI likes to do, and you know what the AI likes to do? It likes to win. It loves to win because I figured out that the best strategy in the end was to transform into the Claydol. 
and to use the level up glitch because Claydol has terrible attack and special attack, and that is bad. It also knows Ancient Power, which, if I get the 10% chance of getting a boost, is very good. But I was doing this again and again and again, trying all sorts of different things, using different items, anything. It wasn't working. Now, as I show you more failed attempts, let's talk about the Pokemon we're dealing with in a little bit more depth. So as you can see, we have a Claydol, Zatu, Solrock, and Lunatone. Now, the Claydol has Earthquake, which we can't use because all their Pokemon are either Flying-type or Levitate. Ancient Power, which is not same type, but pretty decent. Light Screen, which helps because they like to use special attacks, especially Solrock with Solar Beam. And Lunatone has Light Screen and Hypnosis and loves to be a giant troll. I thought about transforming into Zatu, it just isn't strong enough. And yes, I did try Struggle, wasn't even coming close to working. Ditto just isn't bulky enough. While Claydol does have to worry about Solar Beam, we do have Light Screen for that. And we are Psychic type. So their most powerful moves, their Psychic moves, are being resisted, which is pretty good. But I have some bad news. As much as I hate resorting to this, after battling them again and again and again, I realized there was only one way to make this work. Level up. A lot. I need a lot more HP, I'm just fainting too quickly. And because we are using the level up glitch, the attack increases actually do matter. And how much do I level up including some rare candies I found? Level 79. But don't worry, it wasn't just a matter of leveling up. Through battling them like a hundred times, I actually developed a better strategy to manage my power points, and it is the modified Delapa strategy. So what I'm gonna do here is go into the battle with Ditto and use Struggle on Zatu. This is solely for the purpose of having an extra ancient power, which was pivotal. Now Zatu doesn't set up Sunny Day, it goes for Psychic, which is good. It's very likely to do Sunny Day next turn, that means critical hit less good, and Earthquake will now miss because I levitate too. Take that. Because I'm a Claydol, I am outsped by Zatu, which goes for Calm Mind. Pretty good Zatu luck all in all. Ancient Power knocks it out. And if you're wondering, why am I always outspeeding the other Pokemon? Badge boosts. Anyways, Claydol uses Light Screen and I level up. Now, I'd like to get rid of this Soul Rock as soon as possible. Critical hits, Ancient Power boosts, that's what I need. Also, you're seeing why I'm at level 80. Solrock is finally a two-hit KO. It sets up Sunny Day, which is why it's lucky Zatu didn't. And down goes Solrock. Claydol's just kind of doing whatever. I'm not too worried about it, unless it gets an Ancient Power boost. And it clearly is trying to do that, but no luck for either of us yet. But once the Lunatone comes out, I get my Ancient Power boost, which is super lucky, because the Citrus Berry will trigger. Very unfortunate, I do just a little bit too much damage. Claydol goes for Psychic, does not get the special defense drop, and Lunatone goes for Calm Mind, which doesn't matter because, don't forget, in Generation 3, Ancient Power is a physical attack, and I'm able to knock it out the very next turn. And while not getting a critical hit does hurt because I don't have any Ancient Powers for the Claydol, but Light Screen wears off at the perfect moment, Psychic does just under half damage, which isn't great, but not the end of the world because it sets up light screen, which it usually will do as soon as the light screen wears off. I set up my own light screen, which does nothing because Claydol gets a critical hit. And now I'm going to use another psychic so that once its light screen wears off, one more psychic will knock it out. I just have to stall for a few turns, which I do by using Earthquake since it's useless. I don't want ancient power boosts or a special defense drop. I do get one, but the light screen runs out. I use Psychic, and after many, many attempts, so many trials, and tons of errors, I get past Tate and Liza. I know in an edited video like this, it doesn't always translate, but just take my word for it, definitely one of the most difficult gym battles I've ever done. And then I have a bunch more plot stuff, there were a couple battles that were a little tricky, but this video is already almost an hour, and we haven't even gotten to the Elite Four yet. So I'll have to skip them, but the tag battle with Steven Stone was really frustrating for me. But suffice to say, I eventually persevered and made it to Juan. Now I would say that Juan is a little bit more difficult than Brawly, but not as difficult as Flannery. Also not as annoying, but what makes Juan kind of annoying is that we're going to end up using his first Pokemon, and that's Love Disk. And Love Disk is an awful Pokemon. I mean, not Jero's solo challenge awful, but pretty bad. And... I could have gone for the same strategy I used against Winona, 
but opted not to for a couple of reasons. The biggest being Love Disc, like Swablu, is not a one-hit KO without a critical hit, and relying on a 6% critical hit chance is just not very fun. And in order to not rely on the crit, I need to level up. I'm at such a high level, I don't want to do that, and I'm not even sure how the rest of the battle would go. So I opted just to stay as Love Disc, and plus, I was curious, would the delayed level up strategy with Love Disc be enough to defeat Wan? Yeah, but it required a little bit of luck, especially in the beginning, because Love Disc is actually kinda trolly. It has Attract, Sweet Kiss, Water Pulse, and Flail. Two of those moves confuse you, and Attract can immobilize you. Unfortunately for Wan, Ditto doesn't have a gender, so Attract will always fail. But since Love Disc is so weak offensively, what I did was first confuse Juan's Love Disc, and then I just started spamming a track, even though I know it would fail, because I do need to get to struggle eventually. I just am not going to have enough power points for the rest of the fight. Now, slowly but surely, Love Disc is hitting itself in confusion, and its HP is going down, but I'm going to need to attack, so I use Water Pulse, I get a critical hit, I decide to go for another Water Pulse because Flail isn't going to be doing that much damage, and I get a second critical hit. That was pretty huge. I actually was trying to manipulate my HP so that Flail would do a ton of damage after I leveled up and have Ditto's attack, but I can definitely work with this. Now, Whiskash the fight always seemed to go the exact same way, except for one time. Water Pulse would do about half damage, Whiskash would use Amnesia, I would use a second Water Pulse, Whiskash would go for Earthquake, which I didn't want to crit, and then I would knock it out with the Water Pulse. But I got the confusion and it knocked itself out. That was actually the first time that three Water Pulses weren't enough, and I may have needed to reset if it didn't get knocked out just there. But, because I have a little bit more HP than I usually do, Flail is not going to be a 2 hit KO unless Celio attacks. It does with the Body Slam, and it does just enough damage that my flail is a bit more powerful and it knocks out Celio. Crawdont goes how Celio was supposed to go with the first flail doing about three quarters of its HP. It uses Taunt, which isn't as great because I'd like a little bit less HP for the Kingdra, but I have struggle, so I should be fine. Especially if I get a critical hit. And yeah, that's one. I'm happy this only took about six attempts because we're now off to battle the Elite Four. And the Elite Four did not take one attempt, or two attempt, or six attempts, or 50 attempts. The Elite Four took hundreds of attempts. Yes, those of you who've watched my series know I don't save in between battles. <laughs> no, that rule is suspended. Anytime you see impossible challenge, no, I will try to enforce that rule, but it's not always going to be possible. The reason why I call these impossible challenges, obviously almost nothing in Pokemon is actually impossible. But some runs can be pretty close, and this is one of them. Because, even if we save between Elite Four members, we aren't going to always get to use the optimal strategy every time. Since more often than not, the optimal strategy is being very close to leveling up, and then leveling up after the first Pokemon, sometimes with the Delapa, sometimes just with the first Pokemon if it's good enough. But, we can only do that once or maybe twice during the Elite Four. For the rest of the battles, we're either going to need to use Struggle, or we're just going to need to use the first Pokemon and do our best. And to be honest, I made this way more difficult on myself than I needed to, but not intentionally. See, I always want to not save between Elite Four members. I always want to do them all in one go. So my strategy was to make the first two battles, the ones I would usually get to, consistent. The problem that I didn't realize is that I kind of had backed myself into a corner where by going for the strategy I was going for, I wasn't really able to do the next two battles consistently at all. The hardest two battles. And the champion battle. But for about 10 hours, my first goal was to just get past Sydney. Now, like Maxi, Sydney leads off with a Mighty Enna, which is pretty bad because it still knows Intimidate, and so if I want to use Ditto and Struggle, that's not going to be an option unless I go and find another White Herb. Now, you can do that. It's a pickup item, again, available at 1%, so pretty rare, but I spent another couple hours and did find one, and eventually, after many trials and errors figuring out the perfect strategy, let's skip ahead. I leveled up a lot, because like I said, leveling up still matters, even if I'm transformed. 
and thus began the most impossibly difficult Elite Four challenge I've ever done in my life, bar none. Now after many failed attempts, I figured out a pretty consistent strategy against Sydney. It worked about 80% of the time. Now I really don't want to see Sand Attack, which is of course exactly what I see. And that's just going to make the fight a lot less consistent because I could miss it any time. It's a two hit KO to knock out Mighty Yenna. Now Shift Tree has terrible attacks, but it can be very trolly since it knows double team and swagger. And if I hit myself in confusion, that's pretty bad. So it's a two hit KO. It goes for double team, of course. But thankfully, even with the sand attack plus double team, I don't miss, and down goes Shift Tree. Cacturn, also, I'm not worried about damage, but Leech Seed or Cotton Spore, which is what it uses, is pretty annoying, and it's a two hit KO unless I get a critical hit, which I don't. We still have Crawdon to deal with. I have really good health, so being attacked wouldn't be the end of the world, but Sword Stance is even better if I don't miss. Now, because of the Cotton Spore, Absol will outspeed me. And like every other Pokemon, it's a two-hit KO. It goes for Sword Stance. Struggle doesn't miss on turn one. It goes for Rock Slide, and I don't get flinched. Struggle doesn't miss on turn two. And even with the Citrus Berry, I knock out Absol. All in all, this is how the fight usually goes. I mean, if I don't get hit with Sand Attack, it works even better. Also, if I get a critical hit, it works even better. You see, I don't have a ton of leeway. Something else that could happen is I get hit by Swagger, but snap out of confusion fast. And because Swagger raises my attack by two stages, everything would be a one-hit KO. So that's happened as well. And for all those reasons, Sydney isn't usually too bad. I mean, he shouldn't be. I'm at level 98, but notice I didn't level up here. And that is because I had an insanely hard time beating Phoebe. Phoebe is a ghost type trainer, but she's not just a ghost type trainer. Her Pokemon are also very bulky. They know pressure, which is awful for a transformed Pokemon. And her first Dusclops knows protect. However, the biggest thing I was concerned about was that the first Dusclops knows curse. So in this battle, you can see I saved before. It uses Curse, and that's it. There is no way I can win if it uses Curse. When used by a Ghost Pokemon, for a cost of half of its maximum HP, my Pokemon will lose one quarter of its HP every single turn. I will not be able to defeat her in three turns since it takes effect immediately, and thus, if she uses Curse, the run is over. And I just got tired of having to reduce Sydney again and again and again when... This part was lucky. Also, you might notice it was a damage range that I missed. So a bunch of stuff went wrong here. But the truth is, the way I'm set up, if I get past the first Dusclops, I can get to her final Pokemon pretty much every single time. In fact, I did every single time. So let's talk about that. I don't know if it's predetermined, but Dusclops always use Protect turn 1. Transform is unaffected by Protect. So I transform into Dusclops. This is why I needed to be at level 98 because my damage is high enough that I'm usually able to knock out the first Dusclops in one attack. But because the pressure ability is active, that takes away two power points instead of one. And she has four Pokemon remaining and Shadow Punch is Dusclops only attack. It knows Confuse Ray, Curse, and of course, Protect. You may also notice I specifically manipulated my experience points through trial and error so that I level up just after Phoebe's first Dusclops because Dusclops is very slow and I want to go fast. Now that I am fast, I can knock out both Banette and the second Dusclops without any issues. And thankfully, since I only have one power point left, pressure from the second Dusclops doesn't matter. But then comes out Sableye and I don't have any attacking moves, but that doesn't mean I can't win. Tried using Confuse Ray or Curse first. I found that Sableye likes to use double team so I'm going to use Curse first, since that means Curse will be active for longer, and hope, yes it uses Double Team, that I won't miss with Confuse Ray. That is what happens, and now I'm hoping Sableye hits itself in confusion enough for me to stall using Protect, and that I have just enough HP to survive and win the battle. Now, ideally, what I'd like to have happen is Sableye to hit itself in confusion twice. Spoiler, that is what would happen here. If that doesn't happen, you can still win, it's just a lot less likely. Since, as you're going to see, Phoebe would be in perfect range to heal, and then I would just have to stall a few more turns. Sableye has Nightshade, and especially Shadow Ball can be pretty dangerous, so I'm pretty happy when I get this outcome, and this is why saving before really changes things, but now things are bad. They're very bad, because let's talk about Glacia. So, now we can't level up, we can't use Struggle, because there's no way to reduce power points, like, in the Elite Four, 
And so we have to face Glacia using her first Pokemon, which is a Celio. Not a very good Pokemon to begin with, and its only attacking moves are Ice Ball, which is Ice type rollout, and Body Slam. Yikes. Now, this battle didn't take me one or two attempts. It took me hundred. Hundred. And yeah, part of it was learning a strategy, but the truth is, a lot of it was just hoping for some good luck. Because some of these battles are going to be difficult. I'm not going to be able to level up during every single one of them. But anyway, I finally figured out a strategy that worked. It did rely on luck, but I'll explain what happened. I transform into her Celio turn one, and she will always use Hail turn one. Now, I do have Encore and Hail myself, and I can use Encore to lock her Celio into Hail. And then I have the choice between Ice Ball and Body Slam. Ice Ball is actually the better move. It's not going to be good. It's double, not very effective. But my options are pretty limited here. Now, since we're both locked in, it's important to note that Encore has a huge luck component. It can last between two and six turns. Obviously, I'd like it to last six turns, since then I'll be able to select a move again, and I'll be able to use Encore, and I'll hopefully lock it into Hail for the rest of the battle. Now, to make up for the good luck I got in the Phoebe fight, Encore ends very early, and if I get paralyzed by Body Slam, it's a reset. Thankfully, I don't, and Glacia will always try and use Hail once it runs out, which is very good, and I'm able to knock out the Celio number one, with Ice Ball. Next we have Glalie, and I really, really, really don't want to see Icy Wind or Light Screen, so a lot can go wrong versus Glalie. Now I go for Body Slam, ideally I'd like a critical hit turn one, I don't get one, then Glalie goes for, of course, the Light Screen. My second Body Slam doesn't critical hit either, so Glacia is able to heal with a full restore, meaning paralysis didn't really matter, but since she did just use Light Screen, I can use Encore and lock Glalie into Light Screen, meaning it won't be able to attack me. And at this point, I could either go for Body Slam and hope for a crit, or go for Ice Ball. I opt to go for Ice Ball. It's a 5-hit KO. I actually wouldn't mind Encore ending before Light Screen wears off, so Glalie may not use it. But that doesn't happen. However, I get a critical hit, so that's really good. Even though the Light Screen is still up, Ice Ball doubles in power every turn. And so I get to hit Celio number 2 with a max power Ice Ball with the double not very effective and the light screen it does next to nothing but still you know that is some damage now this celio has a bit of a better move set knowing blizzard which can't miss in hail and double edge however i get a critical hit that was humongous i would not have been able to win without a little bit of luck somewhere and so far i've gotten two very opportune critical hits so while it's not guaranteed it's looking good, but we still have Glalie number two, which knows Shadow Ball and Explosion, and her most difficult Pokemon, Walrein. Now, just like the last Glalie, I'm trying for a critical hit. I know I've already gotten lucky, but, you know, would help. I don't get either critical hit, and she uses Shadow Ball twice, but the most important thing is that my special defense doesn't drop, because that would be very bad versus Walrein. Once again, unfortunately, the Glalie's within healing range, so she's able to heal, and I can't use Encore this time because it didn't use a move I'd like to trap it into. But as she heals, the Light Screen and the Hail wear off, and this is big. So now Ice Ball will do a little bit more damage, and she's going to waste a turn setting up Hail, which is going to do nothing for her. So I slowly whittle down its health with Ice Ball. It's very close to knocking it out, and that would be a max-powered Ice Ball against Walrein, and she uses Explosion. Didn't see that one coming, did ya? I rarely show longer losing battles, but I really felt the need to illustrate just how frustrating it could be. Look how much went right, and in one move, it's done. Thankfully, it would only take me a couple more attempts until this run happened. This time, I get a little luckier. Even though I don't get the critical hit, the Encore lasts just a little bit longer so that it syncs up perfectly, that hail ends, the Celio still uses Hail, and I do not get attacked with Celio a single time. The Glalie fight is nearly identical, but with Light Screen turn 1 and Crunch turn 2, I don't get the crit. She heals, I go for Ice Ball, and this time Glalie does not put up its Light Screen again. Plus I got that critical hit, but I also get a special defense drop. That is quite bad, but because of that, it's just using Crunch and I'm able to knock it out in four Ice Balls with no Light Screen, so Celio 2 comes out, is hit by a max power Ice Ball, 
and it does half damage, which is very good. But here I went for a bit of a Hail Mary. I found it used Attract if this happened, and it did again. I don't know why it is. The AI is always confusing to me, but if I know what it's going to do, I can use that against it, and I lock it into Attract with Encore. The Encore doesn't last the minimum, which is good, but I do miss the first Ice Ball. However, the turn the Encore ends, Hail runs out, so she uses Hail, she then uses Double Edge, but that puts it in just the perfect range for me to knock it out in my next Ice Ball. And that means the next Glalie is in for a very rude awakening. And yeah, I wasn't exaggerating. Ice Ball is a one-hit KO, and now we just have Wall Rain left, but we have almost no HP. Is this going to be possible? Unlikely. But you know, I have a good feeling anything could happen. Oh. Darn. Okay, okay, let's try one more time. Celio 1 goes the exact same way as in my last battle, the only difference being a critical hit, which didn't matter because it would have been a 5-hit KO anyway, so that's pretty good. But with Glalie number 1, I get a little creative. It uses Crunch turn 1, and I'm like, you know what? I think it's about to go for Light Screen. And guess what? It did. And so even though I'm going second, I predicted it and use Encore, and... I was pretty happy about that, because now, rather than going for Body Slam, I can go for Ice Ball, and if Encore lasts enough turns, I might even be able to make it past Glalie number 1 without taking any damage. Unfortunately, it seems like it's not going to work out, because the third hit of Ice Ball just misses knocking it out, and Glacia heals, but Ice Ball number 4 does almost half damage, Light Screen wears off, Glacia decides to use Light Screen once again, and there goes Glalie number one. After that crunch on turn one, I didn't take any more damage, so that was a very, very good outcome. Now, with Celio number two, it goes for Hail turn one, and then Attract turn two, just like last time, and just like last time, I knew that's what it was going to do, so I use Encore, and I've locked it into Attract, which doesn't work because I'm a ditto. And once again, rather than using Body Slam, I opt to go for Ice Ball, after turn two, light screen wears off, Encore lasts the maximum, and I believe one of the attracts was actually Glacia's own decision. Who cares? Down goes Celio number two, and we've only taken one attack. Now Glalie number two sets up Hail because it's worn off. I go for Body Slam and I get the Paralysis. That's humongous because I can use Encore now since I outspeed and it just used hail. Well, once again, Ice Ball just misses knocking it out, but because of when hail wore off, the Glalie on its own uses hail after Encore wears off, and Ice Ball number four knocks out the Glalie, so I have made it to the wall rain with pretty much full health, and it's about to be introduced to a max powered Ice Ball. So Surf does nothing, Ice Ball does around a third. Glacia goes for Body Slam on turn two. I go for Body Slam and get a critical hit. Uh-oh, maybe she'll heal, but Citrus Berry either restored just enough HP or she was out of potions. I'm not actually sure which is which because after she paralyzes me and I was very scared, but thankfully I'm not immobilized. And yes, I have beaten Glacia. Oh my God. Ah, <sighs> that was tough. I mean, Thank God the next Pokemon I get to transform into is good. Oh, God. Drake, and I promise you I didn't, made me want to use save states. This was the most obnoxious battle I've ever had because I was just so limited in what I could do. And the only way conceivably that I could win involved just like a crazy convergence of luck. Like, it's awful. So let me show you what I would consider a good attempt. And trust me, when you realize this is a good attempt, you'll see how awful this fight is. So first off, although you saw it, I'm a Shellgon, which is slow and not very powerful, and knows Dragon Claw, a special move in Generation 3, Double Edge, and Rock Tomb. Not a great combo. Now, I will outspeed and one-hit KO Drake Shellgon, so that's not the issue. Then we have Altaria. I can use Dragon Claw, but it's a 2-hit KO, and I'd like to save those. So I go for Double Edge. You may notice I'm not taking back recoil damage. That's because Shellgon has the ability Rockhead. You also might notice Altaria has Dragon Breath. That can paralyze me. That's a reset. Obviously, Altaria is faster, uses two Dragon Breaths. I use two Double Edges. I'm at pretty low health, but I knock it out. 
Now, Flygon is a one-hit KO, and what? I outspeed? That's right, I have the Quick Claw equipped, which has a 20% chance of making me go first. So, one out of three, not very bad. But then the Salamence would knock me out unless the Quick Claw activates again, very low percent of that happening, and you just miss the KO. That's right, you won't knock it out in one hit. Not at this level. I, so close, so close, just so close, but no. No, it, it can't happen. And yes, if I had a Dragon Scale, it would work. But I can't have a Dragon Scale because then I wouldn't go first because I wouldn't have the Quick Claw. And that was with two Quick Claws. Would you like to see what happens if I get three? Okay. This time, I only take a single Dragon Breath from the Altaria. Flygon is a one-hit KO. I have 183 health. Not a one-hit KO with Dragon Claw. Okay. And oh, would you look at that? Salamence's Dragon Claw is still a one-hit KO with 183 HP. Fantastic. And by the way, Drake still has one more Pokemon left. So conceivably to win, I need at least one Quick Claw before the Salamence, preferably two. And then I not only need Quick Claw against the Salamence, but a critical hit. So just to put that into numbers, we have roughly a 6% chance of getting a critical hit and a 20% chance of Quick Claw activating. So just the chance of those happening on the same turn is 1.3%. And that ignores the odds I would need to get Quick Claws in the previous turns, which I would need to get to Salamence. So are you seeing the issue? In the bad battles, I simply get attacked by the Altaria and the Flygon and loot. I mean, heck, just to get a Quick Claw on consecutive turns is 4%. Like, we're dealing with infinitesimal odds here. But what if, what if you got three in a row? A 1 in 125 chance of happening. Well, I did. Here's how that one went. Now, I don't get a Quick Law on the Salamence. If that would have happened, the entire scenario would have had a 1 in 625 chance of happening. There are shiny Pokemon with better odds than that, but it does about 184 HP with Dragon Claw. And I also don't get the 6.25% chance of critical hit. So Salamence heals. In case you were wondering if I could slow it down with Rock Tomb, no, that doesn't work. And yeah, a 1 in 125 chance ends up still not even getting me to the Kingdra. But I'm pretty confident once I get to the Kingdra, I'll win, right? So I just need to keep trying. Well, this battle starts off annoying. I get a miss with Rock Tomb, which is pretty good, but then it uses Protect, so I waste one of my Dragon Claws. That's really bad. But whatever, I'm unlikely going to make it past the Salamence anyway. Altaria uses Dragon Dance and I get a critical hit. The Quick Claw does activate against Flygon, which is pretty good. And now I'd love that Quick Claw critical hit chance, but I get neither. Salamence heals, both with the Citrus Berry and a full restore. And why do I go for Rock Tomb? Well, think about it. There's a 6.25% chance of me getting a critical hit and 20% chance of Quick Claw activating, which is what happens. And because of that little damage that Rock Tomb did, although probably should have used Double Edge, whatever, let's not complain. We have gotten past the Salamence. Now just use Dragon Claw on the Kingdra. Oh, yeah. The Protect. Oh, God. I outspeed with the Quick Claw and get a Double Edge, which doesn't do half. It goes for another Dragon Dance, a crit, and I win. I don't get the crit, and it's going to heal. Yes, it does. Oh, God. Come on. All I need is a crit. No. And smoke screen. Oh, God. Hit. No. No. I've... No. Come on. This took so long. Not like this. Yeah, keep using Dragon Dance. Keep using that. All right. Maybe one more Rock Tomb, and I knock it out. Oh, I'm paralyzed. Please, Quick Claw, help me. Oh, God. Oh, this was a nightmare. So after finally getting what I needed versus Salamence, I get bad luck against the easiest Pokemon, and I don't have a Dragon Claw available. Just awful. I've been at this for two hours, and I finally get an attempt. Oh my god, how long is it going to take? Two minutes. Yeah, sometimes things work out. It only took me another two attempts before I got back to Kingdra, but... This time, Shelgon protects turn one, which is what it usually does. So I don't waste a Dragon Claw and I knock it out. I get the Quick Claw, but not the critical hit. And Altaria uses Dragon Dance. I get the second Quick Claw, that's really unlikely, and knock out the Altaria. 
And let's make it a third quick claw, I guess. Okay, sure. One in 125, who's counting? All right, great. Now we've made it back to the Salamence at full health. I get neither quick claw nor critical hit, but it seems like I did a really low range. I wonder if I outspeed if it doesn't heal. Oh my god. Okay, so good thing I went for double edge because that can't miss. Yeah, that was certainly different, but I actually kind of thought that might happen, so good on me. Although that was pretty lucky, let's be honest. But now we have to deal with Kingdra, one of the toughest... Oh, that's all? A single Dragon Claw is all I would have needed. Ugh. Well, <laughs> I don't know. That's the game. I mean, how can I complain when I got three consecutive Quick Claws? I mean, I can't. Not in good conscience, but just imagine I would have saved all that aggravation. I mean, I know it was only two minutes, but I was so deflated. But now we have one trainer left. And it's not Steven Stone, who I think is a much tougher champion in challenge runs, but Wallace, the final gym leader who I kind of found a joke in Ruby and Sapphire, but he's a bit of a different team and he is champion. But you might notice something. My experience points are very close to maxing out. And that means we're going to be able to use, one more time, the level up transform glitch. And I honestly can't envision using the Delapa strategy because Waylord looks awesome to use. That being said, you know it's not going to be as simple as just a one try. <laughs> Are you kidding me? But enough hyping it up. Let's talk about the final battle. So turn one, I'm going to transform and Waylord goes for Blizzard and misses. Rain Dance is also acceptable. I'd like not to take damage. Now, Water Spout is an interesting move. It's dependent on how much HP you have. With Rain Dance, it's a one-hit KO, or if you get a critical hit, I got a critical hit, so yeah, bye Waylord. And obviously, I could not have planned this out, but I have just enough experience points to level up to level 100 before Wallace's second Pokemon. Now, against the Ludicolo, I go for Double Edge, and I again get a critical hit. Of course, I'm going to outspeed now, because I have Ditto Speed. Of course, I'm no longer a Shell Gone, so there is going to be recoil damage, but... I have something for that too, the Shell Bell. It effectively halves your recoil damage. Recoil takes away a quarter of the damage dealt, and the Shell Bell gives you back an eighth of the damage dealt. And if you're using Double Edge a bunch, like I'm gonna be, it makes a huge difference. Case in point, after knocking out the Tentacruel, if I didn't have the Shell Bell, I'd be at around 170 or 180 HP. Instead, I'm at 219, and 30 HP can definitely be the difference between winning and losing. Now, my Lotic is the first Pokemon that Double Edge does not one-hit KO. Unfortunately, even after Citrus Berry, Wallace still heals. I go for Double Edge again. I thought about Water Spout, but my Lotic has super high special defense. And looks like I was rewarded because I get another critical hit. There are only two Pokemon left. I think we're about to do it. However, I'm almost out of Double Edge, so I opt to go for Water Spout. I'm at low health, so it doesn't do very much. And then Whiskash uses Amnesia. But I do have one double edge left. I use it and it does just enough to knock out the Whiskash. And we have one Pokemon remaining, Gyarados. And we have Blizzard, which is regular effective. This could work. Gyarados has Intimidate, so it's decent not to use physical attacks anyway. Unfortunately, Blizzard misses 30% of the time I miss and it uses Earthquake. Not a big deal. Blizzard does just under half and I gain some HP back, but then it goes for Hyper Beam. Oh no. No, I was so close. Are you kidding me? And this was not my first or second attempt. This was like my 20th attempt. All right. I had learned all these strategies after doing this time and again. This was the first time I actually made it all the way to Gyarados. My low tick is very annoying. Very annoying. I mean, it missed with Toxic. If it hits, that's awful. So fine. Let me change up my strategy a little bit and see if it works. Okay, well, right off the bat, something important happened. Wallace uses Rain Dance, meaning Water Spout will do a lot more damage. So I use it versus Waylord, and it's an easy one-hit KO. Of course, Ludicolo, it would be double resisted, so there's no point. And you may notice Ludicolo outsped me and used Double Team. That's really annoying, and it's the negative side effect of Rain Dance. Some of the Pokemon have Swift Swim. Thankfully, I still hit with Double Edge, and you see I still have the Shell Bell. So my HP is still pretty decent going to Tentacruel. 
Tentacruel is super high special defense, so Water Spout, not a great idea to use here either, and best to go for a double edge. But my Lotic, despite the fact it has super great special defense, I go for the Water Spout. It does, I don't know, about a third. My Lotic goes for Toxic and misses. Perfect. No damage, no status. Double edge, knocks it out. No healing. Okay, this is looking a little bit better. And we move on to face Whiskash with way more HP. Now Water Spout did about half. I gain some HP back. Whiskash does go for Earthquake, but the next Water Spout does just enough damage to knock out Whiskash. And that leaves plenty of double edges left for Gyarados because what I didn't realize is double edge does over half, even after Intimidate. Ditto has amazing attack. I did EV train it fully in attack. Gyarados goes for Dragon Dance, which is the worst case scenario because Hyper Beam may knock me out. It goes for Earthquake. I go for Double Edge. And, yep, after 39 in-game hours. And since I do use the Retron, some of you are curious, 24 real-world human hours. I beat the entirety of Pokemon Emerald with just a ditto. And that's all for this episode, and yeah, this is what I look like. I know people have asked, people always ask. Very disappointing, I'm sorry, or not surprising at all, depending on who you are. But I don't really have much more to say. I thought I would just thank you guys personally. The channel has been doing so well. After that big break, I really didn't think many people would come back, but I'm having some of my best months ever on YouTube. I'm just so excited. There's so many more challenges to go, and... Heck, maybe I'll eventually do one where I actually talk to you like this, but probably not. I prefer being away from a camera. But that's all I have to say. Thanks, guys. Take care.